I'm Michelle. And I'm Lucy. Welcome to another Cameo episode. These, we say very short, but quite often they're quite long. (laughs) Episodes will be slotted in between the other ones, and we will cover people who made a fleeting yet tantalizing appearance in other episodes. We don't always have a lot of information about them, so they can't have a full episode of their own, but they are too interesting to abandon completely, and they fill in the gaps and enable us to create as full a picture of the era as we can. And today... John Stewart, the Duke of Albany. Mm, he made more than a fleeting appearance. <laughs> yes, and what I want to know, is he a relation to the eventual Lord Darnley, Mary Queen of Scots' husband? That I don't know. Mm. Mm. Well, when we do Lord Darnley, eventually, we'll find out, <laughs> we'll find out that way around. Your yeah. father or grandfather was not important enough or interesting <laughs> enough to have a full episode. <laughs> uh, well, he's had, he had quite a chunk of Margaret's episode. Yes. So what have people had to say about the Duke of Albany? Excellent location. Rooms well equipped, comfortable and clean. Very close to the beach. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> this is what we've got? Stacy, the bartender, was excellent at keeping our glasses topped up. We highly recommend popping in to try for yourself. Pet friendly. So what more could you want from a 15th century nobleman? Uh, is, what? <laughs> <laughs> is this a, a current Airbnb or something? Uh, there are quite a few Dukes of Albany pubs. This, ah. That one was, yes. When I typed in Duke of Albany, I got the Duke of Albany um, Weymouth. Okay. <laughs> which sounds delightful <laughs> next and time I'm in Weymouth that, I'm like they don't talk like this what is going on <laughs> yeah Stacy doesn't sound like a <laughs> medieval name does it no uh, yeah John Stewart he played a large sporting role in Margaret of Scotland's episode but that mm-hmm. was only a small part of quite an event for life he was born on the 8th of July 1482 and his father was Alexander Stuart, the son of James II of Scotland. And he was a constant thorn in his brother's side. His brother was James III. I bet you this is Lord Darnley then, because Lord Darnley had claim to the Scottish throne. Uh, it could well be. It's just I didn't want to commit myself because I hadn't looked it up. <laughs> <laughs> <Fair>. <laughs> it seems quite likely, but I don't know. <laughs> the siblings fell out with each other. And Alexander ended up fleeing to France and being welcomed by Louis XI and given a French wife and then invading Scotland with the help of Edward IV. The plan was that Edward would help him get the crown. Alexander would be beholden to him. Scotland would become the puppet of England. Mm. Mm. And it was this invasion that involved Richard, Duke of Gloucester, Henry Percy and Francis Lovell. And they hardly had to do any fighting because, luckily for them, Berwick and Edinburgh both capitulated without fighting. And then they ran out of money and went home. (laughs) Oh, dear. Yeah. Sounds like some of my travels. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. I'm out of money. i got to go home. (laughs) Yes. Dad, Dad, could could you send us some money? I'm stuck in Barcelona. (laughs) (laughs) Did you do that? I never did that. (laughs) I'll pay you back. I promise. <laughs> James the Third was imprisoned in Edinburgh Castle, and Alexander became Lieutenant General of Scotland. So he's won. Oh. And he gave himself the Earldom of Mar, which apparently angered George Gordon, second Earl of Huntley, since he had his eye on that earldom himself. Oh. And I wouldn't have bothered mentioning it, but of course George Gordon, second Earl of Huntley, was father to Catherine Gordon. Lady Catherine Gordon. Yes. I don't know why I like her. We don't know anything about her, but I really like her. (laughs) Awful taste in husbands. That's all we know about her. Yes. In fact, Alexander seems to have antagonised a lot of people since several of the lords went back to his brother and he had to flee south again. When Edward IV died, Alexander had lost his main ally. And in July 1484, he gave it another go, but Richard III wouldn't support him. Uh, He didn't manage to rustle up as many allies in Scotland, so it was all a bit of a damp squib. And he fled to France again, where he was killed in a duel with the Duke of Orléans. That one. The future Ooh, Louis XII. Louis XII. Oh, yeah. Killed, killed uh, John Stuart's dad. 
And it might have been an accident during a tournament, but whatever it was, Louis was at the other end of the oh. of the lance. Whatever pointy bit there was. Yes, Louis was wielding it. Anyway, somewhere in all that, Alexander found time to father some children, including John, our blokey. And he was born in France and became Duke of Albany on his father's death. He was heir presumptive to the throne of Scotland. So, but he was always the bridesmaid, never the bride. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Scotland followed a sort of semi salic succession, which means that the male heirs are preferable, but if there are really no male heirs whatsoever, and they would have looked very thoroughly, yes. a woman could rule if necessary. It would be made very clear to her that she was really was the last resort. Oh, dear. <laughs> On July the 8th, 1505, so on his 13th birthday, John Stuart married Anne de la Tour, Countess of Auvergne. So he had the position of Count of Auvergne until Anne's death. And he was now a member of Louis XII's court at this time, so there was obviously no hard feelings about Louis having killed his dad. Yeah, I'm sorry, please have this position in income. <laughs> it was an accident, honest. Honest, honest it, it really was. In the back. <laughs> we know that on the 9th of September 1513 James IV was killed at Flodden and his son James V became king at the age of 17 months and his mother Margaret Tudor scuppered her chances of becoming regent when she married the highly odious Archibald Douglas oh, what an idiot and everyone except Margaret seems to have accepted that fact immediately ambassadors were sent to France to ask Albany to become regent all in all, he came to Scotland three times. The first visit was the most successful. He arrived with a fleet of eight ships, including the James and the Margaret, which James IV had lent to Louis XII in 1515. Uh, he tried to strengthen the old alliance, partly as a political measure for Scotland, and partly because, as we saw in Margaret's episode, he had every reason to dislike Henry VIII. Yes. I think everybody had every reason to dislike Henry VIII. Possibly not quite so much at this time, but definitely later. Yeah. When it became a scary place to be in the English court. But Francis I, who was king by that time, decided not to ratify the treaty. Because relations between France and England had changed by that time and he didn't want to rock the boat too much. We have a lot of not boat rocking around <laughs> at this time. Albany was so keen that this treaty should go through that he sought permission from the Council of Scotland to return to France and plead their case with Francis in person. And from this came the Treaty of Rouen. And not only did the treaty cover reciprocal help if England should invade one of them, but it promised James V in marriage to Francis I's daughter, and it gave special privileges to Scottish merchants. Uh, and this must have helped with uh, dragging Scotland's economy up. Oh. Mm -hmm. Gavin Douglas was there. He went with him because that was the time he was he'd gone off poetry and had gone on to politics. Earlier in 1515, Albany had been present when Francis I was made king and made his state entry into Paris. And I don't know what Francis was wearing, but surely it can't have been as fancy as Albany's outfit. Silver brocaded white satin, decorated with bird's wings, wrought in silver gilt, which appeared to flutter as he moved. Really? This was trimmed with gold cord, which was knotted at intervals and embroidered in gold thread with his, ne his motto, Sub Umbra Alarum Tuarum, under the shadow of thy wings. And on his head he wore a bonnet of white velvet covered in white plumes. He must have looked ridiculous. Yes, he must have. <laughs> All those little feathers fluttering about. <laughs> now I want... What is that? There's... Uh... A stitch in time. We need oh, them yeah. to recreate that. Mm. Yeah. I mean, presumably they were all dressed to the nines like that. Can't have, been, can't have been the only one and everybody else was quite sober. While Albany was away from Scotland, he left the three A's in charge. Antoine Das, Angus and Aaron. And he came back to complete pandemonium. Oh dear. With Das murdered and fighting in the streets of Edinburgh. Oh dear. Yes, I can't leave you for one second, can one I? One second. Yes, I thought I thought I could trust you. 
as soon as my foot touched the boat, <laughs> you were off. Antoine Dallas is quite a character. Um, I got a bit sidelined with him because he sounded quite interesting. He was a good friend of Albany's. He was called the White Knight since he always wore white armour and a white scarf, which he wore as a favour of Anne of Brittany. And he was the French ambassador. And among his instructions from Louis XII of France of 1513 were commiserating with Margaret Tudor about Flodden, finding out the circumstances of James's death at Flodden, and going to Denmark to give an account of the state of the old alliance. Really? Mm. Hello, King of Denmark. You have yes. a little appearance again. <laughs> Christian, by this time, not John. Ah. Yeah, but that's where he went. <laughs> I won't bother going into the tussles Albany had with Margaret Tudor, since we've covered all that in her episode. In 1518, Albany's sister-in-law, Madeleine de la Tour, married Lorenzo de' Medici. Duke of Urbino. And that's not the Magnificent, that's the younger one okay. that we came across in Mac Machiavelli's episode when poor Machiavelli went to give him the prince as a present right. and it turned out someone else had brought him dogs. <laughs> he <laughs> yep. didn't want the book, he wanted dogs. Yeah. Which is understandable. It was a huge expensive weapon. Web weapon? <laughs> it was a huge expensive <laughs> wedding. Choreographed, if that's the right word for a wedding, by Leonardo da Vinci. Well, yeah, they were choreographed. It was mm. interesting. And this gave Albany a family link with the Pope. Because Pope Leo was Lorenzo's uncle. Right. And Albany was on this like a shot, both for himself and Scotland. And he managed to get the ancient privileges of the Scots ratified by the Pope. Wow. As regents go, he was actually far more of an asset than Margaret was. I think everybody was. I think so. I mean, she could give James V motherly love, but she didn't have a direct line to the Pope. No. And really, what did she gain for Scotland? Much mm, of her battling nothing. was just to be able to be regent for personal reasons. Understandable, but not much help to Scotland. Albany was out there making big improvements to Scotland. Oh, was he? Yeah. Well, he's got, uh, he gets the Pope to ratify things for them so that it's all kosher and legal and I'm sure the Pope didn't say there you go it's kosher now. <laughs> he did work with the council to improve uh, trade hmm. um, quite a lot of things Oh, whereas Margaret you don't get the impression she really did anything of that sort there was a lot except wine yeah yeah and it may be if there hadn't been the tussles over the king he might have been able to improve relations with Henry VIII but it all became a bit too personal and family based in 1519, Lorenzo and Madeline's daughter, Catherine, was born. But within months, both parents were dead. Oh. This made Albany and the Pope Catherine's nearest relative. And Francis decreed that the little girl should inherit all her parents' de la Tour lands and properties. So this made young Catherine de' Medici a very wealthy heiress. And we will certainly be doing Catherine right. de' Medici next season. Yes. But that's her, that she is Albany's... Niece. Oh. Mm. In 1520, Albany again went to visit the Pope, this time to affirm his right to the regency. And he really upset the Master of Ceremonies by arriving at the Vatican during Vespers and sitting with the Cardinals. <laughs> and he was told to get up and go and sit on a footstool until the Pope was ready to receive him. <laughs> Does he say no? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but... I, yeah, I checked it and I was really disappointed to learn that Johann Burchard had died 14 years previously to Aww. this. So Pope Leo must have had his C3PO as well. C3PO. Yeah. Mm. Perhaps that's just how they were. <laughs> <laughs> In 1521, Margaret Tudor was now siding with Albany, mainly because he was able to talk to the Pope to get her marriage to Angus annulled. Mm, right. Albany put Angus under charges of high treason. And Gavin Douglas went running off to Henry VIII to complain about him. Albany's wife died in 1524. Because if you remember, Albany was desperate to get back to France because his wife was seriously ill. And the yes. council were saying, well, no, you can't because otherwise Margaret will muscle in and Angus will muscle in. And he was thinking, yeah, but my wife's going to die. And he didn't. He was really keen to get back. 
His regency in Scotland ended the following year when Margaret decided that her son was old enough now to rule on his own. And he was 12. 12. You are not old enough to do anything (laughs) at 12. No. But he decided that, yes, he could rule on his own. So Uh. goodbye, mother. Don't need you. James V wrote a sort of thank you note to Albany, saying that he hoped Albany, quote, will remain as good a friend as ever to the realm and its king, who will do his best to respond, for there is none more closely allied to him by affection and blood, unquote. Which must have been a real kick in the teeth for Margaret. Yeah, well, look at what she was doing. Yeah, but there's no one closer to me in, in blood Oh. She's, his, she's his mother. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> After this, Albany lived mainly in France, but he obviously continued to hold Scotland in some affection, as you would, I suppose, if you're the heir presumptive. We know he owned an illustrated manuscript written in French about the history of Scotland. And it's illustrated rather than illuminated because some of the pictures of the kings look like cartoons. Yes, they do. And we know it's Albany's since his motto is plastered all over it. Oh. And it starts with a a poem of praise for Scotland. Quote, Powerful princes, this present chronicle, triumphant of dignified renown, demonstrates by very clear evidence how the very magnificent kingdom of Scotland has bruicked sovereign and antique, and nobody knows what bruicked means, because it was filled with great valour, unquote. Following this, there's a message from the translator or scribe, or both, saying how rubbish he is at translating or scribing, or both. (laughs) (laughs) And it really isn't worth reading, so don't waste your time. (laughs) Oh, dear. And then it goes on to say the book's purpose is to illuminate the truth about the merits and noble remains of the great Scottish ancestors. Which is not truth, it's a hagiography. Yes. And I've listened to the Scottish season of Rex Factor, And yet, I hardly recognised any of the names of these kings. I don't know where they got them from. But one did leap out. Ayeth? Ayeth is the one. (laughs) (laughs) Hashtag remember (laughs) Ayeth. Well, we do remember him. He's mentioned in this book. (laughs) He is. And this book was translated at Albany's command. So, a little, or not so little, memento of his time in Scotland. Albany was caught up in the Italian wars, and he was quite fortunate. The French army was split in two. One third of it, led by Albany, was sent to attack the papal forces. Different pope by this time, so there weren't any family implications. um, (laughs) Family relations are going downhill very quickly. No, no, Leo's gone. He's got to attack Naples, which was in Spanish hands at this time. The other two thirds of the army fought at the Battle of Pavia, So if he'd gone with Francis with the other part of the army, he'd probably been one of the nobles who were taken prisoner. Or, like Richard de la Pole, killed. Killed. As it was, his army didn't fare much better and they never actually reached Naples. But (laughs) (laughs) A more realistic attempt of how this is supposed to go. Everybody stops you before you get there. (laughs) Yes, yes, yes. They obviously thought... Now, hang on, we made a mistake last time. Yes. Now, what is it we didn't do? Yeah, I know what we didn't stop them, did we? Yeah, we sort of let them through and gave them Mm. gifts so they wouldn't touch us. And that didn't work. It didn't (laughs) work. (laughs) He carried on working as a diplomat for both France and Scotland. Wow. And he he went to Rome to negotiate with Pope Clement VII about the marriage between James V and Catherine de' Medici. And she was 12 by that point, although this didn't come off in the end. I was going to say. Yeah, no, it wasn't him. And then he was part of the lengthy negotiations to secure the marriage between James V and Francis I's daughter, Madeleine de Valois. But as we heard in Margaret's episode, poor Madeleine had no sooner got to Scotland than she died. She died, yes. In fact, the negotiations were so lengthy that by the time James and Madeleine were married, Albany had already died. Oh, he fell ill and returned to his home in the Auvergne, where he died on June the 2nd at the age of 54. Oh. So he died in his bed. Surprising. Never, never bad going, really, is it? No. No. But, uh, so that's the Duke of Albany. So he sort of fits in quite nicely with a few other people. Yeah. He's one of these uh, 
sort of stickleback people that sort of not stickleback. What do I mean? Stickle-bricks I don't people. know. <laughs> <laughs> he's, a, he's a stickle brick man. That um, I don't know what a stickle brick is a either. A stickle brick is a bit like Lego, except it's got pokey things out. Ah. And so you stick them together and they pokey things slide into each other. Ah, so, okay. you know, one of them will stick to lots of others. And that seems to be okay. the case. We've got Catherine Medici. We've got his yeah. dad trying to get the throne. Yeah. We've got various popes. We've got lots of other people. We've got the Battle of Pavia. So, um, yeah, his life brings in a few other things that we've heard about. Yeah. Which is always fun. Cool. So that's him. And somebody died in their bed. Yeah. (laughs) It's been a while. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And we've both got storms, so it's lucky we've managed to get through this without the electricity cutting out. Yeah. (laughs) Or the thunder, surprisingly. Weird. We just got wind and rain. Yeah, we've got a lot of wind and rain right now, but yeah. there was thunder earlier. Okay, well, I'm sure nobody's interested in our weather, so no. we might as well go. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye.